No, it's just fake. I'm recording a video for YouTube. What? Wait, wait, wait. I'm just it's just a video about fluid mechanics. I know a better way of starting this video. The year is 1936. The electric guitar was just invented, Pope Francis will soon be born, and a British zoologist by the name of James Gray is about to publish a paper on animal locomotion that will stun the scientific community for over 60 years. Gray's endeavor was quite simple. He wanted to study the mechanics behind dolphin swimming. His curiosity came from watching a dolphin swim from stern to bow of a 41 meters ship moving at 16 km per hour in only 7 seconds. Gray was very impressed by the flashing speed of the cute cetacean, but he got even more surprised when the final conclusion of his study made it clear that it was impossible for dolphins to swim this fast. The theoretical resistance caused by water was far greater than the propulsion dolphins could ever generate with their limited amount of muscle. This is Gray's paradox. A riddling contradiction that came as a big surprise for the dolphin community. Because dolphins are the fastest mammal on water, achieving top speeds of 64 km per hour. To solve the problem, the zoologists speculated that dolphins must have a special skin that creates a very uniform flow around them, thus nullifying most of the friction caused by the water. In one of the attempts to test this hypothesis, scientists who had noted that fast swimming dolphins had folds on their skin tried to replicate the results by towing naked women through water. Because they also have folds on their skin? Look, I'm not making this up. Google it if you don't believe me. This assumption made a lot of engineers during the Cold War think that if they could copy the skin of this jolly mammal, they would be able to create faster submarines, missiles and boats. Unfortunately, Gray was wrong. To solve this mystery, three brilliant minds were assembled. Our player one is Frank E. Fish, a marine biologist that got interested in the paradox in 1993. To unravel the contradiction, Fish created a nitrodynamic model of swimming dolphins. But that was not good enough. To completely shatter the paradox, he knew it was necessary to directly measure the thrust produced by the tail of the mammal. In comes the second player, Timothy Wei, an engineer that was studying Olympic swimmers using a technique called DPIV. Wei used a curtain of air bubbles under natural light to track water flow by recording the motion in a high-speed camera and later analyzing and processing the footage, he was able to calculate speeds, accelerations and, most importantly, thrust. To provide the dolphins, the trio was completed with Terry Williams, Fish's longtime friend and a physiologist at the University of California, who worked with two captive bottlenose dolphins named Primo and Puka. After processing the data, Wei and Fish worked out that the power output per kilogram of the bottlenose dolphin was about 13 watts per kilogram for lower amplitude swimming and 25.7 watts per kilogram for high amplitude swimming, values that follow in line with Gray's results of 21.4 watts per kilogram. Which at the time were considered highly exaggerated by him, and that is no surprise. To put things in perspective, the power to mass ratio of a professional swimmer is something like 7 watts per kilogram. Fish also concluded that dolphins were actually incurring in heavy drag loads, suggesting that they don't have any special drag reduction tricks. In other studies, dolphins achieved even higher specific power outputs. What begs the question, where the hell is this power coming from? Gray was wrong in many of his assumptions, but in one thing he was right. For the demonstrated values of water friction, and the normal muscle output of a dolphin, it should be impossible for them to swim this fast. So what gives? As it turns out, dolphins are highly efficient swimmers. They have an astounding efficiency of 81%, which means only 90% of their effort is not put to good use. And that in itself explains why they reach the speeds they do. But if you're like me, and I'm hoping you are, a bunch of questions should be popping up in your head right now. Like... How do they do it? Can we copy them? 
Isn't it weird that a guy named Fish solved the paradox from a guy named Grey being this paradox about a grey fish? Dolphins are not a fish, you moron! To answer these questions, we need to look into some recurring concepts in the realm of fluid dynamics, like drag. As anything moves through a fluid like air, water or Nutella, it will experience a resistance known as drag. The thicker the fluid is, the more resistance will be imposed. Drag is also proportional to the relative speed of the object, meaning the faster it moves, the more friction will be experienced. Drag is normally quite simple to calculate, and simple to understand as a mathematical formula, unless we are talking about non-Newtonian fluids, like slime. Disgusting and complicated slime. The thickness of a fluid is also very important, and the scientific name is viscosity. High viscosity means a thicker fluid, which also means it offers more resistance to being deformed. In the longest scientific experiment in the record books, Pitch, a high-viscosity fluid, has been flowing and dripping into a cup since 1927. Until now, only 9 drops were counted, and the 10th should only happen in the mid-20s. Most people would probably label Pitch as a solid, but it's actually a liquid at room temperature, with a viscosity 100 billion times greater than water. On the other side of the spectrum, we have Helium-3. When this isotope of helium is cooled down to a temperature near absolute zero, it starts to behave very strangely. This exotic fluid is able to defy gravity by leaking out of a half-full cup, or take a shit on the laws of physics by flowing through solids. This is what is called a superfluid, and is called a superfluid for a reason. In this state, helium-3 has no viscosity. And when a fluid has no viscosity, something cool happened. This is footage of inviscid flow around the ball. Inviscid meaning with no viscosity. Look at it. Zero drag. No resistance. It's so beautiful. So uniform. So... Theoretical. This is not what happens in real life. In real life, drag always shows up to the party. In several forms. Being that most of these forms are the result of our main course for this video. The Boundary Layer Effect The Boundary Layer Effect exists because viscosity not only defines the level of thickness of a fluid, but also its stickiness. And because all fluids have viscosity, they all are sticky. When a fluid flows across an object, the layer of fluid in direct contact with the object sticks to its surface. This results in loss of speed that also slows down the layer immediately above it, a little bit. And that layer slows down the one above it, a tiny bit, which in turn slows down the one above it, and the one above it, and that continues until the layer above is not at all affected by friction. This defines the boundary layer, a thin layer of fluid in which the effects of viscosity are important. Outside the boundary layer, we can consider the flow to be in viscid and without friction. This concept was first introduced by a German engineer called Ludwig Prantl in the context of aerodynamics, where the boundary layer tends to be a pain in the butthole. The best scenario in aerodynamics would be one in which the boundary layer is laminar and flows uniformly across the object, thus minimizing skin friction and drag, just like James Gray had proposed for the dolphins. But a laminar boundary layer is very unstable, and for high speeds flow, like in the case of dolphins or planes, tends to transition to a more turbulent flow generating vortices that increase skin friction significantly. A turbulent boundary layer is not the worst that can happen though. When the wings of a plane reach high angles of attack during liftoff, the boundary layer tends to completely detach itself from the wing, what creates an area of low pressure that sucks the wing behind, thus creating the worst kind of drag, pressure drag. To delay layer separation is commonly used a turbulator. <laughs> I fucking love this name. A turbulator or vortex generator is a device used to trip the thick and slow moving laminar boundary layer into a turbulent flow, thus delaying the layer separation. These are commonly used as thin vanes on wings of planes and on top of cars to increase aerodynamic efficiency. Another good example of this are golf balls. Ever wondered why golf balls have little dimples on them? These small irregularities roughen up the ball surface and force turbulent flow around them, 
what allows them to reach longer distances with less effort. In nature we can also find natural vortex generators. Many species of birds have a leading edge on their wing that delay wing stalling at low speeds by tripping turbulent flow. This edge is called the allula. These are all good ways of minimizing drag and playing with the boundary layer effect. But none of them is, in my opinion, as elegant as the way dolphins do it. Dolphins have a hydrodynamic body with smooth curves and smooth skin that helps maintain a laminar boundary layer. In their back they have a dorsal fin that helps stabilize the direction of swimming and also acts as a turbulator. As means of propulsion they use their tail. By moving it up and down they displace water and by the law of conservation of momentum they create thrust. The tail has two wing shaped flukes which just like wings in a plane produce lift. This lift assists on the up and down movement of the tail what decreases muscle effort and increases efficiency. Dolphin's secret weapon are their flukes. The wing shaped pads of highly dense connective tissue have zero bones in them. This gives them a high level of flexibility and the freedom to move independently of one another. So when the layer separation does occur during flow, the fluke, not being rigid like the wings on a plane, are able to oscillate in the direction of less resistance, to compensate pressure differences, thus creating a highly efficient thrust mechanism that was able to confuse scientists for many many years. And if it's such a good mechanism, why not copy it? Not that easy actually. Animal locomotion is studied for a reason, there is a big degree of complexity in it, and even if we were able to fully comprehend how it works, it doesn't mean we can replicate it. Take human gait for example, we do it naturally, we understand the dynamics behind it, but translating it into technology has proven itself to be really really hard. This video is actually the third on a mini-series I'm making about the Tesla turbine. The next one we'll take a look at turbine efficiency, other turbines and so on. If you like the idea, stick around by clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell. This is it for today, I hope you enjoyed the video and until the next time, bye bye.